Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. This is Reverend Rosemary with you this evening. As we thank God for joining us together again for the study of his word, uh, we are going to open with a word of prayer. Hallelujah. Praise God. Father, we thank you for this time that we have set apart for the study of your word. Holy Spirit, we welcome you and we pray that your working in us will open the eyes of our understanding and empower us to apply the word to every area of our lives. And because you watch over your word to perform it, we thank you for transformation and change lives and for using us to be lights that will testify of your goodness and greatness in this generation and advance your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, today we are continuing with the study that uh, we started last week. So this is part two of the study entitled In Your Patience possess your soul. Amen. Throughout the study, I will uh, recap or you know, review certain things that uh, we have seen last week, just in case you did not get the chance to listen to that message. And also to refresh your memory, if uh, you were there and uh, have listened to that study. Uh, so we are starting today um, by saying that uh, originally the spirit of man that came directly from God related directly to God. But through man's rebellion, his spirit was set aside and his soul took control. And as a result, fallen or unregenerate man is controlled by his soul. Uh, and the soul is made up of three parts. The mind, or as we call it also the, in the intellect, and we also have the will, meaning our uh, decision-making power, the fact that we can choose to do or not to do, it's our will, and then our emotions. And Jesus' substitutionary sacrifice gave to men mental deliverance from being ruled by the mind, or should I say by the senses. Man's spirit that had been slave, a slave ever since sin entered humanity was now able to dominate his thinking and his physical actions. And this is the way God wills it. This is how he had created man originally. And now man is, has regained the ability, the power to be ruled by his spirit rather than by his soul or his senses. Therefore, in Luke 21, 19, we saw last week that uh, we are instructed in, uh, to possess our soul, amen. Uh, and we said that um, in order to possess our soul, we need patience to do that. Uh, the Amplified Version says it this way, by your patient endurance, empowered by the Holy Spirit, you will gain or possess your souls, amen. So a believer's mind should be a God-centered conceptual process because God's spirit brings a new supernatural power source, or if we can call it a life source to us. And the spirit of God now dwells at the core of the born again person's being. So God's spirit 
creates God-centered thoughts in a believer's heart, which should then produce God-centered life actions in his soul. So everything from this point on should originate from the spirit. And this is God ideal, this is his, uh, his perfect will. And this is what we call single-mindedness. And another term for it is being one souled, in other words, S O U L E D. Amen. One souled because there is only one life being lived here. The Bible says that if we are in Christ, hallelujah, the one who is in Christ is one in spirit. So there, there are no two beings there. There is one Christ living his life through us. So God's life, his thoughts uh, from the believer's heart uh, is freely coming forth and producing uh, godly actions, amen, godly thoughts. And the believer then is, if he is single-hearted, amen, or single-minded, is living the truth because his words and his deeds, they match. Life-giving thoughts, life-giving actions become one in that person's life. And as long as, uh, as believers, we remain in submission to God and our soul remains in submission to our spirit, we function in harmony with God and with ourselves. But if at any time we start doubting God's word, or we fall again into rebellion against God, then our soul is no longer in submission to our own spirit. And this agreement, or if you can call it inner harmony, is then broken. And when that happens, this is what we call being double-minded, double-mindedness, amen. This means that in, in that place of double-mindedness, there is a constant tension, amen, constant tension between the spirit and the soul. It is necessary for a believer to maintain inner harmony. Um, for instance, as we said in our last lesson, as Christians, our sense of peace does not depend on our outward circumstances, but on our inward thoughts. So if we think on the negative things that you know, happen in this world, then we are going to be anxious and or depressed because the things of this world bring depression. Amen. They are depressing. They, they create anxiety. But if we think on the positive things of God and we put our mind on heavenly things and think about, you know, what God has given us, then we are going to be blessed. Amen. So truly, um, it all depends on where we choose to put our minds. You know, 2 Peter uh, chapter 1 and verse 4 tells us that the Lord has given us exceeding great and precious promises. Amen. And we also saw last week from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verses 9 and 10 that God has speaks to us about the wonderful things that he has prepared for those who love him, hallelujah. He speaks to us about the fut our future and of the glories that he has planned for us, amen. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter two, verses nine and 10 um, that we referred to last week. And so one of the reasons that 
uh, God has done this is to give us hope, amen, so we can be encouraged, especially when we face negative circumstances. Uh, we can think on these promises. And another um, a scripture that we looked at is Philippians chapter four and verse eight. And I'm going to turn to that passage and read it again. Philippians four, eight, uh, it gives in details the things that we must focus on in order to have peace and remain in peace. It says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things, hallelujah. So we are instructed here that these are the things that we have to think of continually, amen. We are to center our mind on them and implant them in our heart. We can think about our glorious future, amen. Uh, the fact that, um, you know, this life that we are living now, it's very brief compared to eternity that is awaiting us. And uh, as we begin to think on these things, um, you know, the peace of God will just settle in our heart, amen, and the joy of the Lord will rise up, amen, and we will find our peace in who we are in Christ and what he has done for us. And our peace does not depend on our physical circumstances, amen, nor what is going on around in the world around us, amen. And so the discipline of guarding our heart uh, by keeping good thoughts must be done continually. And that will keep Satan from stealing from us. We know that he's a thief. He's come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And we are told, uh, in, instructed in the book of Proverbs, uh, chapter 4, uh, verse 23, that we are to guard our heart with all diligence, for out of it will flow the issues of life. Amen. And so the discipline of guarding our heart will keep the enemy from stealing from us. So our mind, that is the thing, things that we think about, they do control our emotions. And um, the enemy of our soul who wants to get the best of us and wants us to fail, um, he understands this very well. So it is truly up to us uh, to learn from the word of God hallelujah, um, how we are to guard our heart and pick up this responsibility that is given to us, amen, um, and decide that we are going to fight the good fight of faith. The question is not if Satan will try to tempt us, it's the fact that he always does it, amen, and the, the, what is at stake is our future. And therefore we have to have a readiness, amen, to always guard what God has given us. And the Bible even says, be ready to revenge every disobedience when our own obedience is complete, amen. And so, uh, you know, as good soldiers of Christ, we need to develop uh, that sense of uh, perseverance, uh, determination, uh, fortitude, and be consistent uh, in, in, in disciplining ourselves. And when I speak about the, the you know, disciplining the, the, the self, we, we are speaking about um, our thoughts, disciplining our thoughts, uh, choose to think on what the Bible tells us to think about, disciplining our mouth, speak the words only that God gives us, 
in his word and whatever the Holy Spirit lays on our heart. And our actions must be, must be in line with our thoughts and our mouth at all times, amen. And especially in times of adversity. And so our choices and actions have to do really with our character and our willingness to reach the, the potential that God has deposited inside of us in order that we may accomplish these purposes and um, master our destiny. And in God, really, we have the tools and weapons that we need to stand and overcome every adversity. And even developing diligence is something that is doable. Why? Because we, God is backing us up. Amen. We are able to be, be disciplined. Hallelujah. Train ourselves to be disciplined, to do what is needful in order to experience the fulfillment of God's promises in our life. And um, because, as we said, that emotions follow our thoughts, then by controlling the way we think based on the word of God, we can begin to actually control the way we feel. So we are not living by our feelings, but we are living by the word of God, hallelujah, allowing the word of God to gain ascendancy in us so that now we are led and if I can say even controlled, we allow ourselves to be controlled, to be directed, to be led by the word of God rather than the way we feel. And the word of God has the power to change the way we feel. And this is the power that we get when we renew our mind with the word, the Bible tells us to do that in Romans chapter 12 and verse two, that we are to not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, amen. So in the, the process of mind renewal doesn't just give us new information about God's thoughts and his will for us, but the life, the very life of the word becomes infused into our being, giving us the power to change, the power to think new thoughts, which are the thoughts of God and therefore act like him. There is life in the word, hallelujah, praise God. Later on in this study, we will go over, um, I believe, Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. I'm not going to turn there now, but later on, we will turn to support this point that there is a life, amen, in the word that will infuse our being, hallelujah, and give us power to do what God has called us to. So we, without a renewed mind, what happens is that we cannot control the way we feel. Rather, we are being controlled by our emotions. So that without this mind renewal, there is no life change in us. And it doesn't matter what we do or try uh, to do uh, aside from the renewal of our mind, then the problems that we are facing will be the same. The same, we will, we will always um, have to deal with the same failures um, and the same defeats as you know they've always happened in the past. And what this means is that unless we learn to deal with each pain, each hurt, each insecurity, um, each instance of fear or pride and unbelief as it occurs. And as we begin to allow God to cleanse uh, th this junk that we have 
already programmed in us. Unless we do that, then we will just continue to act out the negative things that we have experienced in the past. And no matter what we do or try, nothing will happen because a mind change is essential to a life change. Amen. This is key. And therefore, the renewal of our mind by God's word is actually the only way that we will be able to discern uh, what is true from what is false. Amen. And not only that, through the life giving power of the word of God, then we will be able, uh, as our mind is renewed, to line up our life with the truth of God's word. And we acquire the mind of Christ. And have, having the mind of Christ not only renews our thinking inwardly by setting us free from ourselves, because it, this is an inward work, right? So uh, it sets us free from ourselves. It sets us free from other people's responses. It sets us free from our circumstances because we no longer focus on these things but it also gives us the discernment and the wisdom that we need to deal with what is happening outside as well, so that we can walk um, cautiously, we can walk guardedly. Um, this is what the Bible says, calls to walk circumspectly, aware of Satan's deception, amen. So the word of God does an inward work and an outward work in us. And um, as we saw, um, as I mentioned earlier, there is um, a type of mind that what we've been discussing, which is uh, the single mind or being single-minded, but there is also a second type of mind, which I mentioned, which is um, called being double-minded amen, or double-mindedness. The Bible uses the word double-minded. We're going to look at some of these scriptures in, as, as we go on. Unfortunately, or should I say regrettably, um, this is the place where many believers live, amen, in that mindset of double-mindedness. Um, just as single-mindedness uh, means to be one sold, S-O-U-L-E-D, um, being double-minded means being twice sold, S-O-U-L-E-D, uh, because double means two. So we see here because there are two lives that are being lived simultaneously in that one individual. Uh, what do I mean by this? Well, we have a believer who has God's love and God's thoughts in his heart, amen? In other words, the life of God is in the heart of the believer. But this person has chosen to follow his or her own lust, uh, his or her hurts and frustration and anger, whether it's justified or not, or the guilt or anything that is happening at the emotional level. And so when that happens, God's thoughts are blocked from coming forth. And instead, what is produced is our self-centered actions because they come from the self. They call, come rather than the, from the spirit of God leading and directing us. And again, this is because everything starts with a thought. Therefore, you will find many believers who are in Christians, um, and they may have been Christians all their lives, um, but, but well, by all their lives, I'm saying for a very long time, uh, and they have God's life in their heart, and yet, 
because they continue to make emotional cho uh, choices to follow what they think, what they feel, and what they desire over what God is prompting them to do, then what happens is God's life in them is quenched. Therefore, no one will ever see the difference between such believers and that of their neighbors who may not even know God because there is, they are walking according to the ways of the world. Um, and I mean, the believers are live, walking according to the ways of the world, the same as the unbelievers. So this double-mindedness makes the believer what you would call a hypocrite or a person who is phony. Uh, let's go ahead and turn a passage. And I want to show you what uh, the Bible says here about people who uh, actually uh, profess to be Christians and their works don't show it. Let's turn to Titus chapter 1 and verse 16. Titus 1, verse 16, it says that they prof profess, amen, that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. So, in other words, we see here that this is a Christian who is being conformed. To the world rather than being transformed into God's li likeness. Amen. And so being conformed to the world, they are therefore living a lie. And the words of that person professing that they're Christian and their deeds do not match. Therefore, they are double minded. You have two, you know, if personalities living there. And so double-mindedness is the enemy's game plan. And he will do everything he can to get the believer to act upon what he or she is feeling, what he or she is thinking, and what others are saying, rather than making faith choices to obey and trust God. And Satan knows that double-mindedness will immediately quench God's life in us, amen, in the Christian, so that the word of God uh, will not be passed on. And to summarize quickly what uh, this uh, evil of being double-minded uh, will do, uh, let's say that number one, it will keep the believer unstable in all his ways. Uh, let's go ahead and, and turn to James chapter one. James chapter one, we're going to read from verse six to verse eight. Amen. Um, it says, uh, James one verse six, but let him ask in faith, Nothing wavering. For he that wavereth, it's like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Amen. Hallelujah. So we see here when people are wavering back and forth, it says, you know, like the Bible said that they're like the waves of the sea driven with the wind and being tossed. You know, in other words, you go to and fro, to and fro, back and forth, back and forth. And then it says, for let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. So the person forfeits his rights to receiving answered prayers because they are double-minded. And then verse eight 
settles it, it says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So this is the first thing that double-mindedness will do to, to, to the believer, keep him unstable in all his ways. And secondly, double-mindedness will quench the light of the knowledge of Jesus in our lives. Uh, let's turn to Luke 11 and verse 34. Luke 11, 34 reads, the light of the body is the eye. Therefore, when thine eye is single, thy whole body also is full of light. But when thine eye is evil, thy body is also full of darkness. Amen. So evil here would be being double-minded. Amen. And what, what happens? It quenches the light of the knowledge of the Lord in our lives. And then finally, another uh, aspect of being double-minded is that it causes the believer eventually to fall. And this is uh, stated in Luke chapter 11 and verse 17. I'm turning to that passage. Luke 11, 17 says, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And a house divided against a house falleth. Amen. So we find that wherever there is division in a house, amen, that it cannot stand, that it falls. And this is what the enemy wants to happen, amen, to, the, to everyone, actually, uh, particularly Christians. So if we want to live the life that God has for us, our only option then is to submit to his plan for our lives through being single-minded. And as we show forth his light, that is similar to his life in us, we will walk in truth and we will be true witnesses of the gospel. And the enemy doesn't want that. As we just saw, he doesn't want the word to be spread. He doesn't want the gospel to be passed on. Uh, we saw in our last session that uh, the enemy operates in this natural realm um, through, our, through the soul of the individual, amen? But we have to remember that he does it even though he has no authority. But then the way that he does it, as we shared in our last lesson, it's through the deception because that's all he has. So his strategy is to defeat by deceit. So what he does is that he uses this uh, part of if the free, what, what we call the carnal part of of our of the the person of any any person has a carnal part to himself amen and we're supposed to crucify that part the bible tells us crucify the flesh what the enemy does is that he uses that part and this particular it's, i call it a sin which is selfishness to cause someone or a believer to sin and to fail and this is where it all starts. It starts with our selfishness. Uh, when we live our life uh, in a way that it's focused on us, it's not about God, it's about us. It's about what we think, what we feel, what we want. And the devil knows it very well. And he uses his first and foremost point of attack uh, on the lives of believers. Uh, their lack of restraint, uh, their lack of con uh, control, their lack of discipline. And so the Bible calls it lasciviousness. And if the enemy can conquer us there, he's got it made. And when we allow lasciviousness, which means uh, no restraint, uh, or unrestrained, um, we go around with our flesh 
unrestrained, and at the same time that our flesh is unrestrained, our spirit is itself restrained from the godly prompting of our spirit. Amen. Um, I'm sorry, the, our, our soul is restrained from the godly promptings of our spirit. So here we see the believer's flesh running wild while his spirit is put is bondage. And this is what I would call a two-sided or two-pronged attack. On one hand, he is exalting the flesh and on the other hand, he's quenching our spirit. So it prevents, this prevents the believer from following the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And the truth of the matter is that Christians don't mean to rebel uh, in general against the word, but what they do is that they fail to restrain the thoughts that are contrary to it. I don't think any Christian wakes up one day and say, well, I'm going to rebel against the word of God. No true Christian does that. However, through lasciviousness or lack of restraint, we allow those thoughts to flow through our mind. And before we know it, our faith has been uh, crippled and it has been made weak. And this is exactly what the enemy wants to happen. It's therefore essential that uh, we know what to do to free ourselves from such bondage and how to walk single-mindedly before the Lord. And the primary ways that the enemy uses to keep us double-minded are um, through disobedience, which itself is working through this like, lack of restraint of la or lasciviousness. And another way is through doubt. And an, 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 a very important way also is through pride. And these are three types of behavior that we are going to look at um, specifically and how the enemy uses that. So let's go ahead and turn to um, Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah, chapter 13 and verse 10. And this verse is actually, this is the Lord's word to his people. He's speaking to the nation of Israel. And this is what he says in Jeremiah 13, 10. He says, these evil people which refuse to hear my words, which walk in the imagination of their heart and walk after other gods to serve them and to worship them shall even be as this girdle, which is good for nothing. Let me go ahead and um, read that from the, the NIV. Um, yeah, I think that's a little clearer um, in the NIV. This is, Again, Jeremiah 13, 10 says, these wicked people who refuse to listen to my words, who follow the stubbornness of their hearts and go after other gods to serve and worship them will be like this belt, completely useless. All right, so uh, it's a little bit more of a modern English here. So I think we got, we got it. Um, so these actually uh, were the three responses that brought guilt upon the children of Israel. Okay, um, notice that the Lord starts by saying this evil people, amen. God is using the words evil people to define those who happen to be his people. And why is, he calling them evil. Well, he gave three reasons here. He says, number one, they refuse to hear his words. So in other words, he's speaking here of their disobedience. Amen, their rebellion. They refuse to hear. Um, 
And then secondly, and he says, they walk in the imagination of their heart. In other words, they refuse to believe him. They choose to doubt his word and go on with whatever you know, or thoughts the enemy has planted in their heart, the imagination of their own heart, rather than to, to believe God's word. And then thirdly, what they do is that they walk after other gods to serve them and to worship them. This speaks of the, the, the people choosing to have their own way. It's their own way. It's not God's way. It's not about God. And therefore, they choose to follow after other gods, not after the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the true God. No, but after other gods and to serve them and to worship them. So here we clearly observe these, these three types of behavior being used by the enemy to put people in bondage, uh, disobedience, doubt, and pride. However, God has made it possible for us to renew our mind and we can choose to submit to the Lordship of the Holy Spirit and truly come to a place where the Bible states that we are aware of Satan's devices. Amen. In 2 Corinthians 2.11, the Bible says that we are not unaware of Satan's devices. So in other words, we are aware of what the enemy, of his plans, of his strategies. Amen. This means that we can have insight. We can have understanding into the enemy's ways and have God's wisdom on what to do to always walk in victory. Amen. And so as I mentioned that we're going to go in a little bit of de in detail as to how the enemy, those schemes or strategies are used against the believers. And as we saw here, these three uh, ways, main ways, are disobedience, doubt, and pride. So let's look at this uh, disobedience, this strategy. Uh, the, this is the first way that Satan keeps believers double-minded by trying to make them disobedient to God's word. So constantly he's whispering in, in the believer's ears. And I can see in our ears, we all are subject to this, um, you know, attacks. Uh, he's whispering in our ears to go by how we feel, um, to do what we think is best. Uh, he's saying, you know, he's whispering to us not to listen to God. Uh, he's whispering that God doesn't care, that he doesn't love us. Um, and like he lied to Eve in the garden, that we can go ahead and do whatever we want that, like she, he told Eve, you shall not surely die. Amen. And so go ahead and do your own thing and it will be well with you. Those are his lies. Because he, you see, he doesn't want us to see things from God's perspective. He wants us to see everything that happens to us from our own emotional viewpoint, <clears throat> which we, we, would, we can call this a horizontal way of looking at, at things. And Jesus said of him, of Satan, that he's a liar and the father of lies. And, um, he, and he is determined. The enemy is determined in, in, in to keep us consumed in and dependent upon our own negative thoughts, our own uh, hurts and fear and doubts, everything that is negative that you can possibly think of, guilt, um, you know, um, worry, judging, um, bad memories, uh, self-pity, bitterness, unforgiveness, um, being critical, everything that is negative. This is what he wants us to focus on. And if he can do this, then he is, you know, we will just go along with the tide of emotions uh, that is going to overtake us. 
And then we end up being confused, discouraged, and even hardened to doing um, God's word at all. And so we are told, uh, we looked at that passage last week from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. But uh, we're, I'm going to quickly look at this again. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 5 and 6 tells us that we are to bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Amen. And then he says, and having in readiness to revenge all disobedience when our obedience is perfect. Hallelujah. So we are to bring into captivity every thought. We are to cast down imaginations, cast everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Hallelujah. And bring into captivity, meaning take, take the thoughts captive. Amen. And bring them to the obedience of Christ. Amen. Uh, so we need to be constantly putting off what the enemy throws at us. Uh, and at the same time, we are to put on the mind of Christ. We are told that repeatedly to put on the new man, put on the mind of Christ. Actually, the Bible tells us that we have the mind of Christ. Praise God. And so we are to walk in that mind, not allow the enemy to, you know, flood our mind with his own thoughts. This is not how God has called us to live. He wants us to be single-minded. He wants us to go back to that place where originally when he created men, that man's spirit was in direct, was connected directly to God. Hallelujah. Um, and the fall of men came and removed that connection. Jesus came and reestablished it. So Adam, after his sin, could no longer connect with God the way he was before. And he, the, 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 the mode that, was, that, that got switched and Adam then could live by his senses, by his emotions, by his, uh, by his mind, uh, and of course ended up making the wrong decisions. But now that we are indwelled by the spirit of God, Christ lives in us. We have a new spirit, we're a new creation. We are to go back right now to put everything subject to, this, to our spirit, which it itself is infused with God. Hallelujah. So that strategy number one, again, is to keep us in disobedience. Strategy number two is to have us walk in, in doubt. And so doubt is, um, you know, the doubt would be in God's power to perform his word in our lives. And so we can define doubt or unbelief as simply not trusting God to keep his promises or to do what he says, but looking to ourselves or looking to others or things of the world to meet our needs. You know, first the enemy we saw, he wants us to disobey God's word and not to take it every thought captive. But if that doesn't work, then it shifts gears and tries to get, get us to doubt God's faithfulness to perform his word in our lives. And he loves to eat away at our confidence in God. And he's a master at doing this. And he knows actually all our flaws and weaknesses. He's there observing. He's there, you know, tempting us all the time and watching our reactions. And so he knows our, you know, what makes us tick, unfortunately. And his strategy is one of subtlety. He begins by planting a thought in our mind, a simple thought, which we think is harmless. And when we fall into that deception, then that opens the door for Satan to deceive us and continue to plant seeds uh, the, the very seed that are going, that are bringing destructions, destruction in our life. And he does it one little thought at a time. He continues to sow, this, to sow destruction. For example, if we allow ourselves to ponder on thoughts that are contrary to the word of God, 
uh, and we receive those lies and then choose to speak negatively, our actions are going to fall right in line with our words. So instead of thinking about what the word says concerning, for example, uh, our health, we allow ourselves to stop thinking about sickness. And uh, the thinking focuses or rather than the, the word of God that says that by the stripes of Jesus that we are healed, we start thinking to ourselves, yeah, I know the word says that. However, it's always this however or this but, I do not feel healed. So we start walking by our feelings, by our emotions. And one of the deadliest results of this, of unrestrained thinking is doubt. So when we don't make it, don't dis discipline ourselves to choose to take God at his word, and then we allow our mind to just go anywhere unrestrained, then it ends up creating doubt in our lives and our faith is weakened. Unfortunately, we are told that in Proverbs 18 and verse 20, that life and death is in the power of the tongue. Amen. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. The enemy knows it very well. And that's why he is trying, trying to deceive us to take us down that road. Because our tongue will eventually start repeating the thoughts that we've been entertaining in our mind. And he has come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And so if he can get us to be speaking the wrong confessions that will bring destruction and death to our life, then he's having a party while we ourselves are being dece deceived and we are working to towards our own destruction. You see, Matthew 12, 34 says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And the enemy is observing, you know, he prints these thoughts and he's watching how we either we receive or we re reject them. And when we receive them, knowing that we have fallen into, into this trap, that we've been weakened by thinkings on thoughts that are contrary to God, then the enemy comes with bigger attacks and he moves in this time. And if it was just a little issue in health, a, a symptom here, a symptom there, then he moves it with a sickness and disease and more and more, he brings that against us. And it's almost like a deadly sequence that works uh, in the same way all the time. And so he comes and plants the thoughts, which gives birth to the words, which gives birth to the actions and events around us. So bottom line, our unrestrained thoughts lead inevitably to unrestrained words, which themselves leave, lead inevitably to an unrestrained life. And the end of the matter is that an unrestrained life is doomed to destruction. And so our basic needs are really at the center of this issue. Um, doubting the tr trustworthiness of God to have all of our needs met, met um, causes many to look, as I said, horizontally. In other words, they go to others, they go to things uh, to try, things of this realm, this earthly realm, to try to meet uh, the, their need. Uh, for example, some people will turn to you know, money. They make money their God because they want to make sure that they have everything that you know, they are well provided for, et cetera, et cetera. But um, what we need to do rather is to look vertically, look up, look to God alone, because nothing in this world can ever meet our basic needs but God, amen. Um, and we need to get our eyes on him and trust him to provide for all of our needs. It, this is the only way for us to be happy, to be contented, to be fulfilled. No one or nothing can fulfill us. Only God. 
And he has promised in Philippians 4.19 that he will supply all of our need according to his riches in glory. Hallelujah. Paul says this in Philippians 4.19. He says, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. This is his promise. Amen. And he will, you know, he's faithful. He will do it in our lives. If we, and I say if, this is conditional, we have to trust him. And doubt comes and quenches his spirit and blocks what he wants to do. So this is why the enemy wants us to be, you know, being, be double-minded, to be doubting God. Amen. And so we really need to pay serious, serious attention to whatever the enemy, I mean, whatever thoughts come into our mind, we have to learn to discern whether these thoughts are of God or if they are not of him and be quick to reject what the word of God doesn't say, what, what the word of God doesn't say and, or, you know, what the, and know the voice of God when he speaks to us. Amen. Because his voice will always confirm his word. And if the enemy can somehow make us think that God really cannot meet all of our need, then we will not only doubt him, but we will run to someone or something that we think can do it. Amen. Uh, but we are told in scripture that we are to have no confidence in the flesh. Absolutely none. Amen. Because only God can provide for us and fulfill us, amen. And um, an example is Abraham, who um, we know the Bible tells us in Romans chapter four, verses 20 and 21, uh, he said that Romans 4, 20, 21, I'm reading, he says, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able to perform. Hallelujah. So Abraham did not stagger through unbelief at, at the promise of God, but he allowed himself to become fully persuaded, to become strong in faith. You see, and so Abraham had to work at this, just like we all have to work at it, amen, to choose to believe God every time. The Bible says that we are to take the shield of faith in Ephesians 6, 16, amen, that we are to take that shield of faith daily, amen, uh, to quench the fiery darts of the evil one. So Satan is about throwing evil darts, in other words, wrong thoughts, he's trying to plant things, in our mind, our mind has become the battlefield, amen. And therefore we have to choose to believe what God has promised us he will do, regardless of what we see around us, how we feel or whether or not we understand how God is gonna do it. This is not our in ours to figure out. God will do what he says he will do. All we have to do is to believe and to stand, take that position and stand, hallelujah. Praise God. And because when we str stop trusting God, we let our shield down and the enemy is gonna move in with his arrows and he's gonna have the best of us, amen. And we don't want that to happen. Um, and then one, the final strategy here is that of pride. Um, we will go on maybe for another, maybe five, 10 minutes, if you don't mind. Um, because there's just so much to this study. Um, okay, so pride is the third way that Satan tries to keep us double-minded, uh, walking in pride. And it is most deadly because it doesn't affect ourselves, but also other people. And what is pride? It is simply giving ourselves over to or, and following what we think, what we feel, what we desire rather than totally giving ourselves over to God. Um, pride is really loving ourselves. 
and not God. It's we putting ourselves first. It's I before God. It's about self-love, self-esteem, self-seeking. And Satan is always present in that. Whenever you hear the word self, you can know that Satan is right in the middle of that equation. And this is what caused his fall from heaven. And so he knows that very well. And so we have to choose to die to this self. Amen. And um, if not, we will not escape Satan's power over us. Um, I don't believe that as Christians, we consciously uh, want to put ourselves before God. But like it or not, every time we choose to follow our own thoughts uh, and our own ways over what God is prompting, then we are committing the sin of pride. And when that happens, our, the enemy of our soul rejoices. And um, pride will take us to a place where um, it's not only disobeying God's word and doubting his power to perform that word, but we become completely unwilling to follow God at all. And we become so hardened in our own way of thinking that we refuse to be corrected and refuse to change. So we have to be honest and we have to ask ourselves, you know, that if as Christians, uh, we don't consider Christ to be the answer in our own lives, then and, and we have to run to other people, other places and do what, you know, um, you know, go contrary to God's will and ways, then how can we expect to teach others that God um, is for us, that he, is, he loves us and that Jesus is the answer if we ourselves are not leaving that out. So you see, um, the problem goes back to the basic principles of having our security and identity in Christ and not in our jobs, not in our bank accounts, not in our spouses or our children. Um, you see what happens is if one of these supports is taken from us or if we are disappointed in other people um, because they don't turn out to be what we expected them to be, then, you know, we will mess up our lives and not only ourselves, our own lives, but also the lives of others who are supposed to benefit from our stand. Amen. Hallelujah. And the enemy really is after our, our faith. Our, the, the, our, our very faith, the faith itself is after that. And since our faith is built on the faithfulness of God, if Satan can just get us to be disobedient to God's word, to doubt God's power to perform his word in our lives and be prideful and unwilling to follow God, then our faith will crumble and God's life in us will cease flowing. And this is what the enemy wants, but this is, it is our choice, what we're going to choose. Uh, will we choose to follow our own will, our self, disobey, doubt, and follow after other things beside God and end up being double-minded and live a lie? Or are we going to choose to, to follow God by obeying his word, uh, by trusting his spirit to perform his word and following him no matter what he asks us to do? And when we do that, we end up being single-minded and we live out the truth. Amen. And so this is the question that the Lord is putting to us. And, you know, God has given us his word, hallelujah, um, his spirit empowered word. And 
um, before we close, I'd like to look at Hebrew, from, uh, a scripture from the book of Hebrews. I had said earlier that we would look at that passage, Hebrews chapter um, 4, verses 12 and 13. It says, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open and to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. So what do we see here? That the word is able to divide soul, spirit, and body. And God desires above all things that, you know, his word changes us because he wants us to be positioned to prosper, to be in health, even as our soul prospers. And natural prosperity and health are directly related to the prosperity of our soul. And as we evaluate or judge anything that is contrary to God's will and his word in our life, and we become able to do that by spending time in the word, we become, we come to a place where we love the word, we love truth, hallelujah, and God's word becomes flesh to us and the life of the word causes us to experience it meaning this very life in our own life in our circumstances and in our very being therefore as we get god's word in our spirit our soul will prosper our body will prosper the word will penetrate us and bring change and prosperity and this is what God desires for us, that we be sanctified, holy. First Thessalonians 5.23 says this, that God desires to sanctify us, holy, spirit, soul, and body, and keep us blameless until the return of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Praise God. So in conclusion, we have seen what we ought to do if we want to possess our soul. We ought to set our heart and mind on the word of God above all else. Number two, we ought to make the firm decision to take authority over every thought that comes into our mind, amen. And thirdly, with the help of the Holy Spirit, we ought to, learn to know Jesus intimately while bringing our thoughts into obedience to him. That is how we will possess our soul. Hallelujah. This is how we will prosper and be in health because our soul is prospering. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, Father, we thank you, Lord, for this word tonight. We see in your word, oh God, that through practicing it, that the flesh, the carnal men can be trained to know the difference between good and evil. Lord, in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14, it is said that strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Lord, we thank you that we understand that what this um, scripture means, oh God, hallelujah, that you want us to use your word we want us to constantly apply your word, doing it over and over 
until our senses are exercised, O oh God, and we are able to discern what is good and what is evil. And we thank you for the corresponding grace, O oh God, that we find in your word, that we find in the, in, in, through your Holy Spirit at work in us, hallelujah, through your presence in our life. This grace to be diligent and to continue in your word so we will know the truth so that the truth can make us free. Father, in the name of Jesus, we reject spiritual laziness, oh God, and we purpose to walk off this battlefield as winners. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you that you are faithful to complete the wonderful work that you have started in us. Hallelujah. You're doing it, oh Lord, for your glory and for our rejoicing. And for this, we give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise. We worship you, oh Lord God. There is none like you. There is none besides you. We worship you, oh Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Hallelujah. Now unto you, O oh Lord, who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory who is exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I pray that this study has been a blessing to you. I invite you to join us again next week at the same time. God bless you and have a good night.